Thanks everybody to the second event of the March 11th anniversary of the teach-in of 1970, the Environmental Action for Survival or Enact teach-in. And we're gonna start by having a slideshow, a short slideshow of the events from 1970 created by the Environmental Justice History Lab at the University of Michigan. And then we're gonna play a short video clip and then bring our six distinguished panelists up. So everybody in the room, please be quiet because you're being picked up on the mics. This is the teach-in poster for the NACT environmental teach-in, which was a big production here at the University of Michigan six weeks before Earth Day, March 11th to 14th, 1970. NACT's first newsletter. An act asking the president of the University of Michigan for funding for teaching. Gaylord Nelson, the architect of the first Earth Day, saying that the University of Michigan teaching would inspire similar demonstrations around the nation on April 22nd. An enact planning committee, mostly graduate students in the sciences and public health were behind an act raising money and awareness on campus. Enact sold buttons in downtown Ann Arbor to fundraise for the teach-in. And all over the world. All over the world. Don't 50, pollute. 50,000 roughly. Ride a bus instead. Here's the Enact program advertised in the Ann Arbor News. A banner on the Diag, Enact. Graduate students came up with the adaptation of the anti-war slogan, Give Peace a Chance with Give Earth a Chance. During this time, anti-war activists and students for a democratic society were protesting against Dow Chemical, among other things, in the Vietnam War, using napalm. The Black Action Movement was demanding reforms and greater representation and enrollment of African Americans on campus and went on strike just a couple weeks after the teach-in. The first big day was March 11th, teach-in on the environment. As you can see, a distinguished panel. This was at Chrysler Arena. Before the kickoff event that evening, an act held a trial of a car on the Diag. <clears throat> Students protested air pollution, among other things. They put a 1959 Ford sedan on trial. They found it guilty of destroying the environment, hurting inner city poor through depriving them of mass transit among other things, and executed the car on the diag. <laughs> An act also organized a protest where students took non-returnable cans to the local Coca-Cola company and dumped them on the lawn, and then cleaned them up afterward. <laughs> many high school and elementary school students were involved. Here's one of many protests by local Ann Arbor students in this case, Carpenter Elementary School students protesting air pollution. The kickoff rally took place in Chrysler Arena, the basketball arena. It was a sold out crowd. Doug Scott, who will be on the panel in just a few minutes at the kickoff rally. Ed Faber, a student representing the Black Action Movement, demanded that environmentalists take consideration of poverty, racism, and bigotry as part of their campaigns. And I secured the cast of the popular production Hair at the kickoff rally. They came over from Chicago to put on the show. Gordon Lightfoot, a popular folk singer, performed Into the Night. Senator Gaylord Nelson spoke at the rally. 
He was really the founder of the Earth Day Movement idea. Day two, March 12th, 1970, focused on population and a sense of an overpopulation crisis, pledge of responsibility towards zero population growth. Many forums on day two, including this one about the future of the Great Lakes. Day three, March 13th, 1970, the highlight was a panel on the root causes of the environmental crisis held at Pioneer High School in the Ann Arbor area. David Allen, another co-chair of ENACT at the Root Causes of the Environmental Crisis panel. Here's a distinguished lineup at the panel, which included Walter Ruther, the head of the United Auto Workers, and Ted Doan, the president of Dow Chemical. Walter Ruther questioned whether reform could come within the capitalist system, right after Ted Doan said Dow would solve all of the problems through better technology. <laughs> Many high school, elementary school students and community members attended the Root Causes panel. Edmund Muskie, an environmentalist and senator from Maine, spoke as well as Ted Dunn of Dow Chemical. Day four had a huge series of events, as you can see. It began in the morning with the Huron River Walk, a protest march against water pollution. Ann Arbor students, especially elementary school students, were strongly in attendance. This is the Huron River, just a mile from Central Campus in Ann Arbor. We want a Huron River, not a Huron sewer. High school student, in the class of John Russell and an act steering committee member made this poster to protest pollution. Senator Philip Hart of Michigan and David Brower, former head of the Sierra Club, addressed the Huron River Walk. Philip Hart at the Huron River Walk promoting his bill to create the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, which happened a few months later. 1976. Here's David Brower. The um, head of a new group called Friends of the Earth addressing the Huron River Walk. Poster for the main day four events. Ralph Nader spoke at the Citizen Action event that afternoon in Hill Auditorium and blamed corporations and government inaction and government pollution for the problem, demanding radical reforms. There were many panels on the connection between Vietnam War, which activists considered ecological genocide in the environment. Richard Hatcher, the mayor of Gary, Indiana, spoke at the final event, Man's Future, Struggle for Survival. Hatcher was an early environmental justice activist who talked about the impact of pollution on the poor and on non-whites in urban centers and industrial areas. Ralph Nader attacking corporate pollution and Richard Hatcher demanding a focus on urban problems were central to day four of the teach-in. This is the group that was the head of the steering committee for the April 22nd Earth Day. Several University of Michigan graduates were on this group were li liaisons to it including Barbara Reed, second from the right in this photograph, who you will see later on our panel. Barbara Reed gave a speech in Minnesota on Earth Day in 1970. She was the Midwest coordinator for all of Earth Day, saying that corporations, government, and educational institutions had to become responsive to the needs of the people. University of Michigan students were out of class by April 22nd, but these students did celebrate Earth Day. <coughs> Art Hansen and David Allen, two of the main ENACT leaders, reflected on the teach-in and said their goal was to set up an ecology center, one of their goals, in Ann Arbor and all around the country. These are ENACT uh, veterans, including Elizabeth Grant, 
who is in the center behind the ladder, setting up the Ecology Center of Ann Arbor in the spring of 1970, right after the University of Michigan teaching. Elizabeth Grant out front, the original Ecology Center was on Detroit Street in what's now called Carytown. This was the second Ecology Center after one that had been started in Berkeley. The University of Michigan student newspaper, the Michigan Daily, talks about how, how an act has given the university an ecological conscience, promoting recycling on campus and in the community, pushing for the Michigan Environmental Protection Act and federal laws, among other things. An act supported campaign GM, Ralph Nader's demand that General Motors change its policies through shareholder activism, support urban mass transit and reduce air pollution. An act and the Ecology Center set up a recycling day at a shopping center in Ann Arbor in the summer of 1970. This is a conference hosted by the United Auto Workers that brought members of ENACT and environmental activists from around the country, including the national teaching organizers, to the Black Lake Conference Center in Michigan to plan a grassroots environmental crusade that would take into account environmental justice as well as environmental sustainability and would connect labor unions and the urban poor and industrial workers and others to the campus-based uh, environmental movement as well. We're gonna play a short video clip now from a documentary film made by the University of Michigan's Television Center right after the teach-in, and then we'll transition to our panel discussion. The teach-in which began with a car smashing on the campus of the University of Michigan and ended with a walk along the river, is now over. Since that time, a national teaching has also come and gone, and what's been the result? Here are two gentlemen who helped organize the University of Michigan teaching, Art Hansen and Dave Allen. Gentlemen, did the teaching work? Well, I think in some respects the teaching was a success. I think there are ways in which we can point to it and say it had a positive influence. A great number of people were educated, were made aware of problems. And I think that one of the really important, important messages that ecology has is the, is the message that ecology involves the system of the entire environment. And so it brings together many disciplines of study. And I think that that's one thing which was brought out at our environmental teaching. The many disciplines that are involved in the environment, the breadth and depth of the environmental movement, how there's a human environment as well as a natural environment. I think people became aware of this, and I think that was good. Have you noticed fewer beer, beer cans along the road due to this interdisciplinary involvement? I don't really think it's reached that level. In fact, the change may take so long and be so gradual that I don't think we can see it. I have noticed some people say that they have personally changed. Those of us who worked in the teaching personally changed. You know, it's a small step. There's a good, a good point there with the beer cans, though. I think one of the problems uh, when you're dealing with something like beer cans is what do you do with them? Do you ban them, or do you just send out people to pick them up? And I think one of the problems now that we face, you see the uh, tremendous amount of public relations uh, activity and industry convincing us that we have to return our beer cans for half a cent or something like this, rather than really going to the root of the problem and just stopping uh, the use of them all together. And I think this is the sort of thing we have to watch out for now that the teachings are over. We're going to be uh, subject to a real barrage of uh, uh, industrial propaganda, if you want to call it that. There's a real question whether they've taken it seriously or not. You know, the, the, the news media made a great ballyhoo about our environmental movement, but they rather treated it as a spring tiptoe through the tulips. It was a bit, it was a bit sarcastic, a bit facetious in their treatment. A kind of intellectual panty raid on the establishment. <laughs> yeah, in a sense. And it's not clear whether, whether people are, are taking it serious, if the establishment people are taking it serious. For example, the Secretary of the Interior on April 22nd, Earth Day, announced the approval for the new road through Alaska to go with the pipeline there. So there are signs which are not good ones, which are quite negative. What about the teaching leaving the campus and going to the city? Are you going to take it there? Yes, I hope very much that this will be the result of the teaching is for example, an ecology center set up in every town, a major town at least in this country. This would be an informational center, such as one in existence in Berkeley, California, and we're setting one up in Ann Arbor. 
and this will serve to continue at a, a lower key than the uh, frantic pace of a four-day teaching, uh, the informational aspect. I know you two worked very hard, and so did several hundred others. Would, let me ask you this. Would you do it again? Well, in a sense, I would. If there had been no environmental teach-ins, I would now work on it. I would do it again. But to have a second environmental teach-in, I would say, quite definitely, we don't need that. What we need now is to get out and organize grassroots, get into the community, just as Art was saying, develop ecology centers, try and work with people and educate people. I, th I think we've had the ballyhoo, and now we need the real action. What up? Awesome. Oh, sorry. Hey, come on up. We're going to bring the six panelists up now. Give us just a minute for the transition. Oh, so great to be with you. Uh, and water. Some magician has created George, water. right here. <laughs> Who's moderating you? Me. Good. <coughs> Oops. Get in there, Doug. Well, if I will stop. Doug, you want to make sure you turn your phone off, please? It's way over there. Your phone right there. Oh, that one? Yes, please. How many have you got? Yeah, Way too many. <laughs> One. One. Okay, so welcome to the panel featuring six University of Michigan alums who were involved either in the Environmental Action for Survival teaching in March of 1970 or planning the National Earth Day series of demonstrations and teachings on April 22nd, or in some cases, both. My name is Matt Lassiter. I'm a professor in the history department. I also started the environmental justice history lab on this campus. And that first project was a group of eight undergraduate students created a website exhibit called Give Earth a Chance, Environmental Activism in Michigan. We interviewed most of the panelists here today. We have 700 documents, including the ones you just saw in the slideshow that are on that website exhibit, you're uh, welcome to visit. And it is a real honor and a thrill to bring back these six uh, graduates of the University of Michigan, featured prominently in this historical project, and most importantly, in the environmental politics and awareness movement in 1970 and beyond to be with us here today. The Environmental Action for Survival Teach-In what took place from March 11th to 14th, 1970, with a few events on March 10th as a kind of preview. There were more than 125 events on the University of Michigan campus and in the Ann Arbor community. I'm not going to say more about them because we're going to let the panelists who organized them do so themselves. This was a prelude and an important um, precursor of the Earth Day mobilization on April 22nd, 1970, that involved more than 20 million people. The largest protest, and it was a protest, not simply a, a kind of you know informational event, the largest protest in American history up to that time, and one of the largest ever. And we have um, several people on the panel who were centrally involved in planning that, especially Barbara Alexander, then Barbara Reed. So what I've asked the panelists to do is prepare approximately seven minute uh, statement for the first round of questions, and then also in the second round of questions. And so I'm not gonna moderate with a heavy hand unless they talk for too long. Instead, I'm gonna, and I'm not even going to introduce them very much at all because I really would like them to introduce themselves. But we're going to go in this order. Doug Scott will go first, and then David Allen, and then Art Hansen, then Elizabeth Kingwell, and then George Coling, and then Barbara Alexander. And so the first question for the panel, and we'll start with Doug, was just to ask them 
to introduce themselves, talk immodestly about their biography, what they have done in their lives, but also then talk specifically about anything they want to tell you about starting in the fall of 1969, planning the environmental action for survival teaching at the University of Michigan, their favorite or most important memories from the events of March 1970, and that era. And then after a round, we'll come back and talk more about the legacies and what happened after 1970. So Doug Scott will go first, and Doug, you're up. Thank you, Matt, uh, and thank you everyone for being here under these inauspicious circumstances. The Dow fell another six, almost seven percent today into true bear market. And many of you don't remember a bear market on Wall Street. Um, a bear market is when it drops over 1,500 or thereabouts points on the Dow. Um, the, my, my involvement, I came here to, so I could grow up to be a national park ranger. Didn't happen. Um, in the spring, or perhaps it was the, well, in the spring of 1969, maybe the fall, probably the fall, um, a Japanese student, not a student, of Japanese, but from Japanese heritage, um, mentioned in passing to one of the forestry or wildlife students from uh, this school that he thought it would be great if the um, environmentally interested students would organize something along the same lines of the huge anti-Vietnam War protest that happened first on this campus and mushroomed into an enormous national movement. Um, I participated in the national part of that, uh, but not, I wasn't here for the first one. Uh, it was organized by a professor from the history department, I think. All over. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you come from good stock academically. <laughs> um, this idea was raised with a group of us who regularly met upstairs at this level of the building for uh, brown bag lunches, and we thought it was a hell of a good idea. So we set out to call a mass meeting, and I don't know if that's still the case, but when you had a great idea for something to do, that's what you did on this campus. We used a room on the main floor of the main library, the name of which I forget, um, and the room overflowed. I believe we put a little ad or a press release in the Ann Arbor News and the Daily, but nothing more than that. And uh, of course, we were crippled. There was no social media. There was no email. Um, we, uh, some crippled, it turned out reasonably well. Uh, we, uh, the room was overflowing. And from the outset, it was students, faculty members, and people from the Ann Arbor community at large. And that set the model. Moreover, the steering committee that we then assembled from all three groups, on, from the student side, it represented everyone from three members of the Weathermen, one of whom got arrested and was put on trial while we were doing all this, uh, all the way over to a, a wildlife student named John Turner from Wyoming, an enormously conservative Republican who was appointed by George H.W. Bush to be the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Talk about impact. The president of the university um, was approached, Matt showed our letter, uh, by Dave Allen my, and myself. Dave was a biology <coughs> doctor. That was a zoology yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 there you are. Yeah. Um, and uh, he kindly provided uh, full fellowships for a year with no 
obligation to do anything other than <coughs> organize the teach-in. So we had a full ride. And we had the support of the university administration, which was very helpful. Uh, Dave and I just had a great time. We recruited this steering committee, and the steering committee began <coughs> to lay plans. I don't know where it came from, but in my makeup, uh, and everybody else seemed to be the same, was the general theory to make no small plans. And we did not. We ended up, as Matt said, with a five-day program, 156 events reaching into every department of the university. And two things about that. Just as an example, the law school brought together for the first time ever 10, and there were only 10, uh, lawyers and law professors who were founding the special legal specialty of environmental law, period. Uh, at that point, um, they held a panel discussion over in the law school in a big room, and uh, many law schools and others uh, joined in that um, in that uh, program to uh, and, and thus we have a burgeoning and now huge environmental law movement with whole organizations like Earth Justice. Um, with broad environmental agendas, uh, even to international law for environmental justice um, uh, at work. Uh, the second thing was that uh, that broad program simply enabled people who had good ideas to do them. I don't know who thought up the uh, put a car on trial and then charge a buck for people to get a big hedge, sledgehammer and bash the thing. But the Ford, Ford did it and they're just over here, you know. Um, and I think the CEO at that time and even now probably prefers to live in the bucolic academic surroundings of Ann Arbor in some McMansion. Um, we also, as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, had a panel at the high school with a bunch of important people, notably the president of the Dow Chemical. I learned today, because I, I was there, but I didn't remember, that he was not booed. The booing was reserved for Senator Edmund, Edmund Muskie of Maine, who did not deserve it. He was a huge champion all his career for clean air and clean water and other extremely important subjects like that. Um, and I forget why he was booed. But um, uh, we even, the only, the only place that we asked for the Ann Arbor police to give us, or maybe it was the state police, to give us protect, uh, police protection was that panel because of the Dow Chemical guy. I had gone to meet him in Midland at their headquarters and, and a perfectly nice guy, but they manufactured napalm, which was being dropped and murdering gazillions of people, villagers mostly, uh, in the Vietnam jungles. Uh, and he responded to my request for help financially with a $5,000 check. We raised, I don't know, fair amount of money. In today's dollars, it would be about uh, just under five, uh, $500,000. So it was about sixty-five or $70,000. Yeah. That was and our budget expectation of 70000 Yeah, make no small plans. And um, we spent every dollar, as far as I know. Except that we had a surplus, which I'll talk about later, okay. for the ecology good, good. that turned into this organization that uh, I was uh, mentioned the ecology action center. Turned into the ecology center. Doug, I'm going to stop you and you'll yep. get another chance. Yep. Yep. Um, Good. So, David Allen was the co chair of the NACT along with Doug Scott, and we're going to hear from him next. And I'll just remind the panelists 
because I'm not doing a long introduction, <laughs> just make sure to tell people a little bit about yourself and your credentials as well. Sure. Okay. So good afternoon. I'm David Allen. I'm really excited to be here, and it's a wonderful opportunity to get together with uh, old friends and colleagues and, and relive a, a really important year of our lives that I, I think was impactful. So uh, today I'm Professor Emeritus in the School for Environment and Sustainability. Fifty years ago I was a graduate student here and evidently thought that bushy sideburns were the uh, height of male fashion. Uh, I, was, I was a graduate student studying aquatic ecology and I was kind of between the School of Natural Resources, which it was called then, and the zoology department. The zoology department was interested mainly in fundamental ec ecological questions. Uh, the School of Natural Resources was interested mainly in managing and improving the environment. And I think I always had um, a, a foot in both worlds. As an undergrad, uh, I was a, a field tech on salmon projects all over British Columbia. Uh, but I had wonderful courses in genetics and statistics and ecology. Uh, at that time, the University of Michigan was the place to study ecology. I think it still is today. Uh, so I came here for that purpose. And at the time that this, uh, these events began to unfold, as a graduate student here, uh, I was involved in a lot of the activism that all the rest of us were in, particularly anti-war. And when the teaching on the environment idea um, emerged, and I think Doug was really the one who, who brought it to this campus and, and, and brought us into this idea, I thought, way more fun than working on my PhD thesis. <laughs> and so for the next year, I joined uh, Doug and Art and the rest of the people here uh, on, on that activity. And just to share some recollections of what it was like, excitement, sense of purpose, uh, camaraderie, spontaneity, and I think similar to something Doug said, a lot of good things and activities just kind of happened. Now, Art's been very helpful in reminding me of a lot of the organizational structure that was there, but it was a, a lot of things that just happened in a, in a really um, uh, grassroots and collaborative way. Uh, so it was a big deal. It had a, a very big budget. Uh, Art was instrumental in both getting that money and managing that money, and, and I think in so doing uh, brought a lot of the organizational leadership to it. Uh, Something I think was fortuitous was I think the leadership team had be complemented one another really well. I can't even name all the people who were involved, uh, people at this table and more, but I think we just brought different skill sets together and, and, and I thought I'd just tell some fun stories. So one day, you and I, Doug, are in the office, Manning, we had these phones, phone rings. I happen to pick it up. And it's a, uh, it's a reporter, a journalist named Joseph uh, Kraft. <laughs> and uh, I didn't read the newspaper, so I'm saying, I'm saying out loud, oh, Joseph Kraft, um, what, what papers do you write for? And he's saying, LA Times, New York, you know, uh, Washington Post. It's like, he's big, he's big. You know? <laughs> so I realized that you know, there was a place where you were much better connected to uh, that external world than I was. Um, and I also want to talk about some of the entertainment events. So, uh, so we, we had Gordon Lightfoot and the Chicago cast of Hair, and I was trying to remember how we ever found these people. We also almost had Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, so it's amazing that they were ready to, to come to this event. Uh, so Art helpfully reminded me it was an, another one of our group named Frank Chaika, who apparently went to a Lightfoot concert, jumped up on the stage afterwards, and somehow talked Lightfoot into bringing his band and coming to the, the teaching at, at, at no charge, at just expenses. Um, and so I must have come into it at that point. I think Frank must have given me the phone number. So I remember calling up Lightfoot, talking to him on the phone, making these arrangements, helped, helped just the logistics of getting him here. So I was a big Lightfoot fan, and still am. And so I thought, this is my chance to meet this guy. And so after the concert, I don't think I dreamed, I think this is true, after the concert I went up to his, his room, knocked on the door thinking I'd introduce myself. Lightfoot opens the door, clearly inebriated. There's one of the cast of, of hair in the background, woman in the background, and I realized this is not a good moment. Gordon did not invite me in. Uh, so 
<laughs> that was that was my Gordon Lightfoot experience. Uh, uh, I don't ever recall you mentioning that to me before. <laughs> <laughs> I kept it a secret. I don't think there were that. any women in the cast of Hair. Well, then there was. <laughs> oh, oh yes, 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 there were. were. Well, in, <laughs> in the group that came here. Well, well somehow there was there was a woman in that room. I can <laughs> vouch for that. Yeah. Um, another event that I think is kind of fun to remember, and, and Matt, I'm not sure it made it into any of the history books, but there there was a. Um, it was a congressional delegation, state yes. or federal, that Committee. held hearings. Subcommittee. Subcommittee. Subcommittee held hearings. Yeah. And a group of women, that included my wife, did a sort of a guerrilla theater kind of uh, routine on women's issues. And, uh, and this group, all sort of older men, were very polite and very, you know, said that was all very nice and it was all very cute and all very mild and probably um, uh, a little bit too cute and mild for everybody's uh, hopes for that, but it was kind of an interesting. That was the only time I saw women's issues come to the, come to the fore. Uh, so a couple of stories just to entertain you. Um, this was one of the, this event was one of the highlights of my personal history. And I feel really fortunate to have worked with this group of people. Uh, but after it was over, I still had a PhD to finish and a career um, to pursue. And for me, that was pretty much a conventional academic career path. Um, finished my PhD, did a postdoc, became a professor for the next 20 years, grants, papers, teaching, publishing, that kind of stuff. Um, by the late 1980s, there was a, another kind of awakening, I think, taking place uh, that was really focused on the, on, on the notion that the science of ecology and related areas really wasn't engaging with the problems of the time, and particularly the problems of loss of biological diversity. So conservation biology, restoration ecology, these became terms, these became professional societies, they began to publish journals. And that's what got me back into a, a, a more active role. I was in the zoology department at the University of Maryland. Uh, we began a conservation biology program. Then this university wanted to have more presence in conservation biology, and I joined this school as a conservation biologist, got an office back in this building, and deja vu 20 years later, I'm back in the basement of, of SNRE. <laughs> uh, from that point onward, things got a little more varied for me. I became active in uh, some environmental groups, serving on boards and serving uh, uh, science advisor, American <clears throat> Rivers and the Nature Conservancy. Um, I did some uh, legal consulting, but only for the good guys. Uh, and I like to think I'm still making a contribution, but I, I'm sort of interested in talking about how that role has changed. I think I care as deeply about these environmental issues as I ever did. Uh, but I also think that, you know, this is just, we're in one long slog in which you celebrate your gains and you, you know, you deal with, with your losses. For myself, I have certain technical expertise in aquatic ecology and certain professional legitimacy. And so I, that's where I personally can make my, uh, my best uh, contributions. I care especially about uh, fresh water, our lakes, rivers, and streams. And so those are the areas that I continue to be active and still am active in today. So in my second seven minutes, I'll look at lessons learned and work undone from, from those perspectives. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Next, we're going to hear from Art Hansen, who was the treasurer of an act, but really a, a co-leader, I think, and tell us about his experiences. Art? Sure. And uh, I guess I'll start off by saying I certainly learned how to use the word no. No, you can't spend anything on that. <laughs> you go find your own money, whatever. Uh, but it was a, that was a struggle. But where I'd like to start on this is, uh, I'll introduce myself in a moment, but the, th the thing that's in my head about the teach-in, it was that first night, uh, the big, the big uh, huge crowd, and the cast of hair coming out, and this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And then, no, well, I don't think we ever got the age of Aquarius. I'm not sure I would have wanted to live in it anyways. But the second part of it is uh, let the sunshine in. And I think I've built my career about, uh, including the teach-in, on letting the sunshine in. Trying to change, uh, you know, it's an opening of a window so people think differently, uh, that you expose the things that need to be exposed, corruption, bad practices, et cetera, et cetera. And, and my, uh, when I came here, I'm Canadian, and uh, Dave and I shared a common undergraduate uh, and uh, master's program sorts of, a, no, he came here for his master's first. 
And I stayed in the real masters, which was uh, <laughs> he had to go off and do research for a long time and then come back and defend it. And uh, so I went uh, to the just a terrible place to do research, the island of Barbados, and uh, did <laughs> marine ecology for a year working on the beaches. It was a little sand crab on the beaches. So I was a true blue uh, scientist in my own mind. And my environmentalism goes back to when I was about eight or nine years old, when I lived in uh, a place uh, near Vancouver that was a, an idyllic setting. Our parents would let us go off, uh, our parents, you know, my friends and I, and we would go off to this creek. And this creek was, uh, it had various problems in it. It had been a salmon stream, and it was in a valley that was still very green, and uh, mountains uh, not that far away. Uh, so anyways, it was a very safe place. One day, and I learned a lot about ecology, frog pond, uh, secondary growth of forests along, it was idyllic, and we loved it. And we learned about uh, ecology without thinking about, didn't even know the word. But anyways, one day along comes a bulldozer, and bulldozers are right along to the edge of the stream, uh, a thing for the environment, which was a sewage line, which wasn't going to be treated, but it was going to drain the sewage out, and it was very convenient to use this corridor. Destroyed my frog pond, that was the worst of it. And I thought, how could adults be so stupid? How could they do this? And then some years later, when I was probably 12 or 13, something like that, um, they put a, a freeway in. It was the first freeway in British Columbia, and fortunately got stopped at the edge of Vancouver. But at the time, I thought, my gosh, what is this thing? It looks interesting, but what is it? Again, with overpasses, it went very much <coughs> close to my creek. And I really felt, you know, People are really being stupid. We had never heard the word environmental impact assessment at that point in time. That came, as we know, uh, just around 1970, 69, 70. And even then was not practiced very well in the United States or any, and that was the first place it was practiced. So anyways, that's background to me. And I came to this, so from the heart and from the, uh, the head as well. And the head was very much oriented towards being a good scientist. No ideas of being an activist at all. And I was trained as a, a fisheries ecologist, and so I liked fisheries, and I actually like marine biology even more. Um, but um, anyway, so when I came here, it was to do science, and as David said, uh, the best people in North America were here, uh, several professors. To my good luck, I ended up, because of certain things, in the School of Natural Resources rather than in the zoology department uh, where David was. Uh, I did courses there and that as well for my PhD. Um, but the neat thing about the School of Natural Resources was it was good to be thinking about different things. Bill Stapp working on environmental education, people working around the university, Kenneth Boulding, uh, Joseph Sachs, uh, environmental law. I mean, you know, this was opening windows for me that I had never even thought about. And, and I could go on on that for quite a bit in public health and so on. I never took courses there, but I learned things there. Business school learned things. So it, it gave me a, a broadening of my approach. It was really important. So well, when we got in, I won't repeat any of the history of, uh, we're, we all confabulate, you know, so we each have slightly different uh, histories uh, about it. And, <laughs> And, uh, but it, it comes down to the fact that uh, we weren't that smart. We didn't <laughs> invent all this stuff. We picked it up from others. But we also rode a wave. It was a time when it was a, you know, you could almost do anything. That's the uh, important point. If you trusted in yourself, and then the important thing, not just the School of Natural Resources, but I found this university, which was an overwhelmingly large place then, for me at least, uh, was very enabling. The door was always open. We met with presidents, we met with deans, we met with people who wanted to help us, the community of Ann Arbor, uh, and, and that is fantastic. There was nowhere in Canada that was a place like that at that point in time. Uh, and so the enabling aspect, and what I have said to people for the last 50 years since then is do something when you're young enough that is enabling that gives you the trust that you may be right. You may not be right, but you think you're right and you have based that on evidence and knowledge and so forth. And even if you don't feel it's within your capacity to do it, just do it. And that was really what we were doing, just do it. And then 
uh, as have the others have said so far, what we found is a lot of people were really worried about this topic, didn't know how to approach it, wanted to be part of this whole thing, and, and that was fantastic. Now, I'll go, move then, uh, I'll come back to some stories later about being treasurer and that, but the, the fundamental point was I'd sort of stand at our meetings and say, uh, with my hand behind my back, you know, with fingers crossed, oh yes, we're doing quite well, we sold $200 worth of buttons, knowing what everybody was wanting was to hear thousands of dollars of this, that, and the other, and some good stories there. But, but uh, uh, the important point was, until we got very close to the end, I had no idea that we were really going to make it financially, and that was tough, because I did not want to say, no, we're not going to make it. That would have you know, destroyed certain things. But, but in the end, we came out with a surplus, which was very nice because we wanted to set up an ecology action center, and we gave them the money to get going with that surplus. So that was great. Thank what you. A, All right, I'm yeah. going um, to stop, stop you there yeah. for the second round. That is a perfect transition to Elizabeth Kingwell, who helped start the Ecology Center of Ann Arbor. She was Liz Grant back in 1970, and also one of only two women on the ENAC Steering Committee, and we'll hear from her next. Oh, my name today is Elizabeth Kingwell, and I was a first-year graduate student in the fall of 1969 in the School of Natural Resources, now known as SEAS. I was on the Steering Committee of ENAC, but I wasn't there originally. I replaced a male doctoral student who was getting <laughs> a hard time from his major professor because he wasn't <laughs> tending to business and um, thought the professor thought he was wasting his time dealing with the neck. So that gentleman's job was outreached and since I outreach and since I was pretty vocal about so what was happening and what was not happening, I was handed that job. Uh, be careful what you complain about. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, there wasn't much time to do all that work. It was that fall and that spring. So we accomplished an enormous amount. And I think if we'd realized what we were going to get ourselves into and how much was actually going to happen, we probably would have all gone the other way. Um, <clears throat> when I was doing my outreach job, I really wasn't aware of the larger political scene that was going on that began the teach-ins on the environment. Doug Scott, Dave, and Art were probably more, way more involved in that, and I just had my head down. Uh, but Senator Nelson um, developed the National Committee on the Teach-In before that, and they sort of handed out help to people who were um, interested. And we were first, in a sense, because we were on a trimester system, and we, came, and we were not in school on the official uh, Teach-In Day or Earth Day. Uh, it was a spin-off from Vietnam, um, and I was really only aware of my work in getting the town of wider Ann Arbor to come to the teach-in. There weren't families and children at the, uh, the teach-ins on Vietnam, um, <clears throat> and I remember friends, Tex and Cricket, designing all those posters, including John Turner, who apparently came up with that little boy behind the globe. And at the time, outside of that little office in the basement, we argued about all the various uh, designs and concepts they were coming up with and whether the art that we were picking fulfilled the ideals of the teach-in. And those pins went around the world. They, as Art was saying, even after we finished, um, Germany was ordering boxes and boxes of them. The ecology thing was really a new concept. And we went up, I remember, to talk to UAW at their getaway retreat, the conference center up north, and that was outreach. Some of the committee, including me, went to the first small college teach-in at Northwestern in Chicago in early spring. We needed to learn the basics of, oh, putting on a such an affair, crowd control, safety, health issues, sanitation, and it became so much bigger than any of us really had either hoped for or thought of. My numbers are 50,000 attendees during four days of 125 meetings, seminars, and lectures. I'm beginning to wonder if anybody really knows. Um, Doug Fulton was an outdoor editor of the Ann Arbor News, and he had a very wonderful reputation both locally and in Michigan. And he was the one that I was told I needed to get on board. I needed to convince him that we were legitimate and that this was something that he could um, get behind, and he did. I, uh, one of my first real public speaking experiences, I almost failed speech class, 
uh, was speaking uh, in front of a small contingent, including him, and he was very wary. He wasn't even sure he wanted to come, and he was sitting there with his arms crossed. But I convinced him, and he helped enormously. I really think he was a very big part of the success of the teach-in and of the Ecology Center afterward. He was actually the first president on the board of the Ecology Center, I believe. Um, there was a moment when our ANAC leaders thought we should be more radical and were kind of considering trying to spice it up a little bit. Um, but to tell you the truth, were, we were a bunch of pre-foresters, environmental educators, and game management guys. So that idea was shot down. Um, I really wanted us to be true and honest to our audience, and I was most certainly not wanting to run off people that I was trying to get to come and listen. The times were hard, the students were radical, there was a protest on every corner. Women's rights, racial injustice, poverty, the war. Everyone was either strongly for or against something. Many of the men had either just come back from the war, were worried about being drafted, or were considering leaving the country. Groups like the Students for a Democratic Society were advocating for the overthrow of the system entirely. We were pushed from every side to include all points of view. There was just no room for all of it during the teach-in. We had to try to focus on the environment. The big evening opening was marred by the students of a democratic society. I believe that was the group we let in. They insisted on having a voice, a part of the teach-in, or they threatened to really disrupt all of our events. So they were allowed by the steering committee to speak at the beginning of the program. They were so verbally violent and obscene that many families took their kids and left. I was really disappointed after working so hard to bring in the Ann Arbor residents and their kids. They didn't get to hear the real message. There was diversity, sacrificing diversity. The University of Michigan was largely men, and the School of Natural Resources was particularly full of men. <laughs> Apparently that may have been the first year there were any, that isn't that they didn't allow us in, but they didn't see any reason to let us in. Um, I had a very big argument with a very well-known um, uh, doctoral student, and the guy yelled at me that the sole and only important thing was environmental action. I disagreed. I was talking to him about women's rights and the role of women. He wrote off all causes except for the environment, so I didn't get very far with that argument, and my personal attempt at inclusivity failed. One of the men remembers me being the only woman on the steering committee. They were willing to take any offers of help they could get. If it was a woman, that was okay. And while inclusivity was not a priority and not something that was a goal for natural resources males, they tolerated it. We all had our committee's ideas and plans. Rare meetings were a check-in and about what was going on. Discussion was only occasionally acrimonious. We were riding on the heels of the war protests. What should be the level of anger? of emotional excess, of even violence that would get our message out. Was radicalism necessary for publicity or credibility? Including radicals but not being violent or radical was how it went. Listening to all voices and working together did work. Remember all those people were full-time students except for a couple people who were paid and I didn't know that. <laughs> um, we were all busy trying to pull off our teaching job as we individually defined it, as we envisioned it, and still survive academically. We were those idealistic 60s students who believed in the democratic process with inclusivity of ideology, individuality, and creativity. It was a loose coalition of similarly minded students who believed we had information to share that would be embraced by not only students but the general public if we could only get the information to them. And it worked. It was a lesson in community to be able to walk to the White Panthers, talk to the White Panthers, and to use their copying equipment in a basement for our needs for the teaching. It was a lesson in being able to communicate with a wide range of people and convince them we had common interests with respect to a healthy environment for all of us. Who got Arthur Godfrey to come? The cast of hair, the Michigan governor. There were so many bright, intelligent, creative people, as are all of you. The pressure was on to get a great deal done. A great many ideas had to be developed and pulled off. There was one there and then another one over there and here we went. <coughs> But water was polluted and on fire. The air was foul. Environmental action really was an idea whose time had come. Sprinkling, sprinkling intelligent, created, committed University of Michigan students from across the campus, and it worked. The tipping point concept fits what happened at Michigan in 1970, and it explains our part in the ripple effect that went across the country in April of that year, then across the globe to become an important part of the zeitgeist. 
the critical part of the teach-in was that everyone who heard that in our environment was endangered also got the message that there was something they could do about it. We gave them suggestions for acts both individual and collective that would make the difference, everything from recycling to political activism. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. The next panelist that we'll hear from is George Coling. I'm George Coling. I was a uh, biology major at the University of Rochester. I graduated in June of 69 and got a public health fellowship at the School of Public Health. Um, this um, is part of the background that I remember from the time was that while being a graduate student, I was also draft status, a 1A, draft lottery number 51. Oh, jeez. And had a rural draft board in central New York. Uh, and the teaching, I think it happened, but I was focused on those two numbers, <laughs> a 1 and, and uh, 51 all, all the time. Um, so, um, in the other, the other context, um, coming from this small town, and yes, I lived in Rochester, but um, here I was in Detroit only three summers after the summer of 67 in Detroit, and I saw what was happening on TV around the country, and uh, those those were the uh, issues of the time in which this new consciousness kind of evolved out of me. And um, Liz just had a good point. I wish I uh, had it earlier, but I'll, I'll steal from you. The tipping point. You could join up with an act. You could um, take what Dave and Doug and Art have said. You could do anything. You could figure it out and, and do it and have a program. Um, you, I remember in particular the event at the high school with Walter Ruther and, and Muskie, and I was standing no further away from them than from here to, to Barbara, both of them. And I said, well, you, you, can, you can do anything. Here, here are these people. And you know that applied to Nader and the cast of Hair and Gordon Lightfoot and others, but particularly that event, and also um, the evil twin, Ted Doan, the head of Dow Chemical, who was not only napalming Vietnam, but talk about environment defoliation, 245T, long-lasting um, effects. Um, so my memory is that that was a tipping point that I engaged in with other colleagues in and, and friends. Um, the other really lasting memory I have is um, more after the teacher and very shortly was the Black Action Movement uh, student strike. And maybe in November of 1970, I approached my uh, across the quarter neighbor in my apartment on Kingsley Street a woman, an African-American woman named Marsha Pinkett. She was also in the School of Public Health, and she was a credentialed sanitarian from East Orange, New Jersey, hmm. and knew how to inspect restaurants and sewage connections and things like that. And I said to her, Marsha, would you consider being uh, our outreach messages, we need to reach more to the black community, we call it them, would you consider being chair of Blacks for the Environment? And she did that more in the School of Public Health setting than campus Y, I think. And um, our table of volunteers and fact sheet hander outers and resource people, she worked hard and it, it was, mm, she can get me if I say, it was, it was pretty, pretty good in terms of diversity. Um, so a few weeks after, I think the slide show says it was March 20th, Matt, the Black Action Movement um, started and the strike was gonna start in a couple of days. And I got a call, as I recall, about 11 o'clock at night in my apartment, George, this is Marsha. And I said, yes. 
and she said, remember when you asked me to chair Blacks for the Environment? And I said, yes. And she said, you're in charge of environmentalists for the Black Action Movement. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I said, when is the first meeting? And she said, midnight. And gave me a room. So I remember going to this thing. And I probably had my Give Earth a Chance button on. And I'm not sure if this button, which says Ooh. strike, oh. is actually painted over this one. <laughs> Or not. There are a lot of buttons for everything, but this is a, a, re, a reused, recycled, reuse and recycled button, which has been in my position probably for 50 years. So um, that was the other great memory I had, that particular connection, which I think we'll get into it more, really got me, you can do anything, into the, some of the environmental justice work I did later. Third memory, I'll be very short, was what Liz talked about, and Art had the deal, was the founding of the ecology centers here um, in Ann Arbor. And um, one of our other Ann Arbor colleagues, Bill Painter, moved to Washington and became director of the Washington Ecology Center. And I played a role of the coordinator of the Ecology Center Council around the country and convened with colleagues, the first national meeting in December of 1970 of these centers, which according to that film were supposed to be in every major city. So in a diff in spirit. Thank you, George. Our sixth panelist here in round one is Barbara Alexander. As the camera shifts to her, I want to point out that in front of her is the original Give Earth a Chance podium seal that Ralph Nader, and the cast of hair and everyone performed and spoke behind in 1970. It's a wooden um, seal, courtesy of John Russell, who was a member of the Enact Steering Committee and has kept it safe all these years and loaned it to us for these events. So Barbara Reed at the time was the Midwest coordinator for Earth Day 1970, the national movement, also a University of Michigan alum, and we'll hear from her next. Thanks very much. I graduated from the University of Michigan in 1968. Um, I did attend the first Vietnam War teach-in here. I think it was 1965. Um, my background uh, and interest while I was here was political science, foreign affairs, the study of Russian language, history, um, and I was going to go into the State Department. That was my uh, firm uh, desire in life. Um, but I got on a bus in May of 1968 and went to Indiana to campaign for Robert F. Kennedy. Um, and I had some transformational experiences in terms of interacting with uh, neighborhoods uh, and people. Um, and um, we did uh, the initial art of canvassing. We'd go door to door, we'd take these little note cards and make notes about people's support for Bobby Kennedy and would they vote for him and brought them back to the office. Uh, we were so good at this group of volunteers that they, at their expense, took us to Oregon. I was in Portland, Oregon for that primary and then California, where of course it all ended uh, very tragically. But as a result of that experience, I really had a different view about what I wanted to do, and it was very political, domestic-oriented policy reform and involvement in issues. What issues? I don't know, just issues. <laughs> so, I went off to Washington. Uh, I, I ended up as an assistant uh, which was a glorified secretary, but that's all right, uh, to a wonderful woman at the Conservation Foundation. Um, probably one of those jobs you just luck out and walk right into. And this delightful woman, Martha Muffy Henderson, um, got me involved in research about urban education about the environment. Um, and that was her particular interest at the Conservation Foundation. And the head of it at that time then was asked 
by Senator Gaylord Nelson to help him um, uh, develop a staff and an institution to carry forward the Earth Day idea that he had been promoting for several months around the country and that University of Michigan, of course, was the first um, uh, national large-scale example of what he had in mind. So as a result of being in the right place at the right time, I was suggested as a possible staff person for the national teach-in office. So I was one of those five or six folks who gathered in an alley. We didn't live in that alley. It was, <laughs> it was a photographer's dream shot. Um, and we were all in our 23, 24-year-old age. And we were, like many of you here doing the ENACT teach-in, thought we could do anything. <laughs> and so we did it. Um, and the idea was given to us by Senator Nelson. And there was national press being uh, developed about it all, even as we were going to work in our little office. But I have described what happened as spontaneous combustion because we didn't plan Earth Day with 22 million people involved. It just happened. So we recorded it. We kept track of it. We promoted it. We appeared nationally to discuss it with the press, who became enamored with the idea of what was going on. And it was an incredible groundswell of desire to talk about these issues in a new way. Um, and it was families, white suburban ladies who were doing garden clubs. It was inner city action um, and concern about public health in St. Louis and Chicago. It was students at campuses. It was high school students. It was everywhere and anything. Um, the only as issue that I recall we deliberately wanted to encourage, as opposed to just gathering information that was pouring in to our office, was to make sure that large cities did have um, uh, large scale events. Um, and I remember going to Chicago and helping to organize a whole bunch of groups to plan the Chicago um, uh, uh, rallies that occurred. And um, the day itself, of course, was an incredible success. And I've, I, my interest was, as I say, politics and reform, and I really wanted to work to get better legislation. So I stayed in DC, and we took the energy of Earth Day and turned it into a really powerful lobbying force. All those index cards, because that's all we had. There was no email, there was no cell phone, there was no internet, there was no social media. Um, all of our data was handwritten on cards or typed on a card. Um, and that was a, an incredible lobbying effort that we used to move forward on clean air and clean water legislation in 1970 and 72. And uh, that's where uh, I really uh, found my skill and interest uh, in public issues and uh, stayed in D.C. until 1973, uh, where my then new husband and I moved to Maine. And I went to law school, and I got involved in consumer issues that were not strictly labeled environmental. Um, and I spent 10 years at the Maine Public Utilities Commission, uh, and then opened my own consulting business and since 1996. I have traveled mostly in the U.S., but occasionally outside of it, on behalf of consumers in public utility proceedings around the country. And I didn't really think I was back into environmental stuff until all of a sudden, a couple years ago, I realized I was deeply involved. Because what I found was that a lot of the agenda of the more modern environmental movement was to impose and include a lot of subsidies in your electric bills um, to promote renewables and solar and all kinds of uh, efficiency programs, all of which were excellent ideas, but were being imposed in rates um, that were very regressive and impacted low-income people more 
than I think they should be. So I've been involved in that debate with national and local environmental organizations for a couple of years, and maybe we can talk about that later in part two of this program. <laughs> that sounds great. Thanks to all the panelists for the first round, and we're gonna move to a second round. The question was very broad. We asked them to reflect on the broader meanings and the legacies of 1970. The panelists here, many stayed involved in environmental policy, the Urban Environment Conference, with union support, among others, came out of the Earth Day movement and was really one of the first specifically environmental justice organizations in the country. The panelists were involved in starting the Ecology Center of Ann Arbor and Ecology Centers in other places, the Michigan Environmental Policy Act. Michigan would never be mistaken for a hotbed of environmental activism today, but it was on the cutting edge in the 1970s, the nation's most aggressive bottle bill recycling law and the Michigan Environmental Policy Act, making the environment a public trust and allowing citizens to sue corporations and the government, among many other things. And we talk a lot about ecology and ecological sustainability, environmental justice. These were new concepts. For many people in 1970, I don't, uh, environmental justice was generally talked about as urban pollution or the very commoner in the keynote here at the Enact Teach-In said that ecology means everything is connected. Vietnam, what's happening in the urban centers, what's happening in the wilderness areas, everything is connected. And so we asked these panelists just to reflect in whatever way they would like about the meanings and the legacies of what happened in 1970, both at the Environmental Action for Survival Teach-In for the Environment here at the University of Michigan and the broader Earth Day 1970 events that Barbara, Alexander, among others, were involved in. And Doug, we'll start again with you. Great, thank you very much, Matt. Um, just a few quick memories. Um, last personal note, it was while I was here that I tripped over the activist wilderness preservation movement and lobbying in Congress. Uh, and it was while in pursuit of that that I wandered into Senator Nelson's office in Washington, and I was the first student who wandered through the door and said, you've been talking about this. In fact, it was a little squib in Time Magazine, just a little teeny thing, that was the first thing that came to our attention. I remember being just pissed. He'd stolen our idea. <laughs> <laughs> and later he and I became great friends, and uh, I learned that uh, I'd misjudged the great man. Um, the, uh, and he went on to be the president of the Willard, or counselor president, uh, counselor uh, in retirement of the Wilderness Society in Washington, D.C. Uh, before his ultimate retirement. Um, the uh, events were stunning. Elizabeth's uh, report on the outreach and community engagement was excellent. Um, it's as good an example of, of how what we started, more than we could possibly have thought or dreamed, rippled out across the country and the world. Um, small example, in 1970, this legislature in Oregon and the governor enacted the country's first bottle bill, putting a five cent mandatory return rede redemption charge on every bottle and can sold in Oregon, still in effect. The industry fought it tooth and nail and invented this phony, you see them along the interstates, uh, yellow bags and people in orange vests collecting uh, litter. Um, the uh, bag ladies do a better job with aluminum cans. The uh, uh, ecology center movement itself, I don't know, maybe Elizabeth does, how many there are now? Just two, Berkeley and here. Well, there are more, but we'll hear a lot from George. <laughs> okay, uh, several more. Um, well, that's a good area for people to hone in on. Um, in my wilderness work, I, as a lobbyist, I came in contact with wonderful people like uh, Senator 
uh, Frank Church, Democrat of Idaho, and Congressman Morris K. Udall, Mo Udall um, of Arizona. Very powerful, very influential uh, in my interested field and in others. And finally, on that line, um, in 1980, my college roommate from here, who was the one who approached the cast of hair in Chicago and got them to come. They slept on floors uh, in order to perform for us. Uh, at that huge event with 17,000 people, uh, I whipped out from behind the curtain at center stage in the spotlight and, uh, and uh, said, ladies and gentlemen, the cast of hair. And the mic was dead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there was great scurrying like rats in the, uh, behind the scenes. And uh, they said, I think it'll work now. And uh, so I went back and came out and said, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the cast of hair, huge applause. And the dawning of the age of, the, of Aquarius could not have been better, and I love the story about it. It was really about the second verse, the, let the sun shine in. Um, the uh, national teaching was staff was headed by a great guy who dropped out of Harvard, never went back to, uh, uh, named Dennis Hayes, who now lives in Seattle. And uh, Dennis went on to transition to mobilize for the first energy focused day, I uh, forget what it was called, maybe energy day, but. Sunday. Sunday. Yes. Monday, Monday. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and is still going strong. He most recently wrote an absolutely wonderful book called Cows, which I think has something to do with the contribution to greenhouse gases by the methane farted by cows, but I wouldn't. And the beef industry. And the beef industry, yeah, lots of lots of bad things there. Hence our vegetarian lunch. Um, Doug, could you just tell us also briefly about your work in Alaska? Oh yeah, before, sure. Um, before we wrap this. Uh, so my college roommate uh, Chuck Cluson went to work for the Sierra Club simultaneous with my going to work for uh, for, for the Sierra Club from the Wilderness Society, and uh, he became a uh, part of the Washington lobbying staff as it grew for the Sierra Club. And uh, he was approached by a group of the national environmental organizations, all of them, old line conservation and wildlife, sportsmen, modern environmental and everything. Never happened again. And they handed him the keys and said, we want you to run uh, the Alaska campaign. We knew going in, he called me and asked me to come and run the uh, organize, hire, or uh, dig up the lobbyists, 20 of them, who would come in and out as needed to uh, trod the halls of Congress. They each had eight, 18 members of the House to focus on. Extremely powerful. Um, and I coordinated that lobbying operation. Um, we invented a thing called the, the three-part form, carbonless forms, absolutely magical. Uh, our lobbyists would go up to the hill and we'd ask them to just use their own paper to make quick notes the minute they came out of an office, because you go into six or seven offices and you total jumble. And then they'd come back and my assistant or I would sit and debrief them and we would make notes on the carbonless form and we'd say, yeah, did they really say that or were they just smiling? And um, one of the carbons stayed with us in a central file. One of the carbons went to the media group, which was large, and they were in charge of cultivating, phoning, whining and dining the media. And the final copy went to the grassroots outreach group, another large group of people who came, slept all day and came into the office late. And their job was to sit there and phone and phone and phone following the time zones west. Um, 
so that, and they were looking at a forum and it said, Congressman Foghorn said, the hell with you, we're, uh, we're going to stick with the National Rifle Association who thinks this is gun control by land use uh, fiat. Next morning, that congressman would come to work and he and his staff would be deluged by pink slips and phone messages and mailograms, which were the closest thing to email messages, uh, and I mean deluged. And our lobbyist would go in after a suitable hour or two and they would be on their knees saying, God, what did, what did we say? Call the dogs off. <laughs> what, what was the policy outcome? The policy outcome was fairly simple. We had uh, incredible support from President Jimmy Carter and his uh, Secretary of the Interior, uh, Cecil Andrus. And um, they were, they would do anything. Once a week, I had, uh, on a Friday, I had a uh, uh, meeting with the full-time lobbyist that Carter appointed just to work Alaska. And uh, he, uh, he, I would hand him a three by five card with the names of five congressmen on it. And that day, that congressman would get a phone call from the President of the United States, including members that never had spoken to a president in their life. Um, the outcome, over 120 million acres of new additions, doubling the size of the national park system, doubling the size of the National Wildlife Refuge system, adding 7,000 miles to the Wild and Scenic Rivers system, and um, 57 million acres, larger than the landmass of California, to wilderness areas within those conservation units. Thank you so much, Doug. That's an extraordinary accomplishment. David Allen, again, was the co-chair of an act along with Doug Scott. David? Sure, thank you. Uh, so I really admire uh, the accomplishments of Doug and others who have spent their careers out there uh, in uh, active roles with wilderness society, with environmental groups, or in, in other, other ways in which you know, they're very hands-on. I spent my life in academia and my comments are going to probably sound like they come from somebody who spent his life in academia. I want to talk about really two ideas. Uh, one, sort of the balance between, within the environmental movement, balance between the focus on human issues and focus on nature, wildlands, biodiversity. Uh, because I, I feel that has something that's sort of shifted back and forth in a way that I, that I, I think is interesting and, and maybe important to talk about. Uh, and the second thing is I want to say a little bit about my views of the, of the, of the, the long view of making progress in, in anything. Uh, I'm not just going to compare 1970 to 2020. I'm going to look at some of the time in between. But um, at the risk of really large oversimplification, it seems to me that in 1970, uh, a lot of what, what brought people to the environmental movement was concerns for air pollution, for water pollution, for their health, for things they could see. In 2020, it seems to me, a lot of what brings people to the environmental movement is concerns about climate change, concerns about environmental justice. In 1990, at least within the world that I lived in, live in, uh, there was a lot of focus on uh, wildlands and, and nature and loss of biological diversity. The first Earth Summit, Rio de Janeiro in 1992, uh, came out with two major conventions. Uh, one was the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, the other was the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And they were both important and they're both with us, with us today. Um, and, and yet it seems to me that um, at the present time, we hear rather less about the biological diversity side of, of issues and rather more about the climate side. And, and I, I personally find that a bit disturbing. Uh, I thought I could, I could uh, dramatize it with a story that I read. It was commentary on the, uh, on the democratic debates. And 
Olympics, of which there were so many, and maybe many of you watched them. And, and uh, some, some of us tried not to. Some of you tried not to. <laughs> and somebody, somebody wrote a comment that there should be a new drinking game. Every time somebody uh, in, the, in the Democratic debate said climate change was an existential debate, he took a shot. And you see how, you know, how long everybody could stand up after that. So there's no question that climate is in the fore, and there's no question that climate's really important. Uh, but, at, but at the same time, I think we're, we're hearing less about the biological diversity issues. And I try to think about, you know, what's the comparison of these two? Climate is something that affects people directly. You know, people are concerned about their the economy, about infrastructure, about their personal well-being. Biological diversity is kind of a moral obligation for other things. And, um, you know, I think both are, both are important. But it, it does feel to me like there's a sort of pendulum shift that goes back and forth between, and you know, different people, of course, are engaged for different reasons. Uh, but when, when I, I look at what people are concerned about today, it's how climate affects me and how climate affects the, the least um, uh, advantaged in our communities. And those are clearly important. But to me, it's a narrowing of the environmental ad agenda, and it's a narrowing that, that, that uh, doesn't for me, uh, fit well. Um, are we making progress? I think there's lots of ways to see progress, and I heard uh, Barb speak about this very well earlier. Uh, just thinking locally, uh, the uh, Michigan chapter of the Nature Conservancy is closing in on a 95 million fundraising uh, achievement. That's one state raising nearly 100 million. The Nature Conservancy of Michigan employs a lot of graduates of this school, highly trained professionals doing really smart things, protecting the environment. Um, at, a, at a sort of a, a bigger picture level, these international conventions, uh, are, are, they have their struggles. You can certainly uh, uh, find class half empty stories to tell, but they're continuing to import to um, uh, promote their agendas uh, about biological diversity, uh, about climate change. And so I see progress in that. In my very specific world of freshwater uh, uh, management and, and conservation, um, I see support for what I call the, the three pillars of river management. Repair, restore, protect. We repair those systems that are so compromised that we, that we can't really expect much more than to improve them. The Seine and the, and the Thames have both improved uh, markedly over the last hundred years. We restore those systems where we can see the opportunity to, to return them to a more functional state, if not a historic state, and we protect those systems um, that represent ecosystem types that are uh, deserving of protection and are feasible to protect. So I, I think we're doing these things in a, in a positive way. Probably nothing new in a sense that, you know, you could say, well, these, we've done these things all along. Uh, I think there's more unanimity uh, of purpose, more sense of direction at the present time. So I'm encouraged by all of that. Uh, the other side is say, are things going well? No, no, not even close. Uh, climate warming threatens coral reefs. Deforestation threatens biodiversity in the tropics and other places. The pace of dam construction in developing countries is accelerating, and every year, 8 million tons of plastic enters the oceans from our rivers, joining the 150 million tons of plastic that are already there. Um, in the United States, the present administration is actively hostile to envir environmental protection. EPA has limited the role of, of uh, science in rulemaking, and at the present time, the the Trump administration is actively working to overturn the Clean Water Act uh, provisions that were developed under the Obama administration. And I want to say a bit about that, and, and there's a point to the story. Um, so I was involved in the uh, science advisory committees that commented on the, uh, on, the, on the, what was called Waters of the United States. So I saw the process, and it was in, under the Obama administration. It was a good process. Uh, there were very capable EPA scientists who worked for several years developing a very elaborate rationale for protecting waters that were connected to navigable waters. The, 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 the hitch is in the Clean Water Act. It has language about navigable waters. So what does that mean for wetlands that are adjacent to them? What does that mean for head, headwaters? That regulatory uncertainty 
was a challenge both for the, regu the, the, the community, that did the, the agencies that did the regulation and the communities that were regulated. Uh, and so bringing more clarity to that process as well as bringing other waters under protection were the rationales behind the Obama era uh, attempt to improve the, the regulations, the rulemaking behind the, the existing Clean Water Act. Uh, it was an interesting process because I thought I saw how well it was done, how much science was involved in it. And when we got to the end of the process, policy came in and compromises were made. The headwaters of most streams and agricultural landscapes are ditches. Ditches, by any scientific uh, definition, uh, uh, scientific uh, sensibility, would be included under the Clean Water Act. Top policy people said, we're not going to get this through unless we exclude ditches. And the scientists said, we get it. And so it was an interesting compromise where we had good science, but we tried to make sensible policy. What happened was the day that those regulations hit the Federal Register, the lawsuits came in, nothing's happened. Now the Trump administration um, is, is trying to reverse it. As soon as the Trump administration rules go into, a place, into place, new lawsuits will come in. So it's just stalemate. Um, so some of this particular nightmare hopefully will come to an end in November when the Trump administration <laughs> is we tossed out of office. But in some sense, this is the last point I want to make, uh, the Trump administration may not be the main story. It's just a manifestation. I don't think it's the main story. Uh, the Obama administration couldn't get that much done uh, because of the opposition that, that existed. So clearly there's work to be done in educating uh, ind individuals about the need for these changes. A quick flashback to Earth Day 1970 and what we saw in, in uh, some of these discussions earlier. Uh, was it was radical in its intent. It was inclusive in its activities. We had Dow Chemical, we had United Auto Workers, we had the left, we had the right. It was a very inclusive event. Um, it was a good idea then. I think it's a, a, a good idea now. Uh, I think we, unfortunately, because I don't feel comfortable saying this, but I think we really need to play a long game in which compromise gets us to solutions that last longer than a single political cycle. Because anything that gets done in one political cycle just gets reversed in the next. So those are some of my thoughts of thinking over the long term of what we've seen for 50 years of environmental activism and efforts. Thank you so much, David. <coughs> Arthur Hansen, Art? Well, I'm going to pick up, first of all, let me say David and I have been friends for even longer than 50 years. and. Uh, we need people like David, people that can bring the best truths forward. We depend on that. And so I, I sat in my career as the people with a science background that then translate that to other people uh, who are the policy makers, decision makers and policy makers. And, and uh, I'd say, first of all, uh, that I'm a successful failure, like all of us. We, I mean, we, we carried off the teaching. We've carried off many things in our life since. But the failure, the big failure in society is still there. And it's going to be there for some time. And I agree completely with what you say. This is a long-term game. And, and there'll be many things like the teaching over the next 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, that's important to recognize. That, that's the failure side. We have to address it. Uh, we've only got some years ahead of us Younger people, uh, such as we heard in this last panel, have got a lot of time ahead. But everything is compressed now. It's much more difficult. This is why we've got things like the 2020, 2030 time period where climate change, uh, if we do it right in our actions, is going to make it much easier for the people that follow in the 2040s and 2060s. If not, they're going to have a, you know, it's going to be very bad. So, and, and I agree completely with what David says about the significance of uh, biodiversity. Anyway, back to my, what I did with my life afterwards, sort of a thing, because it, it, these teachings had a 50-year influence on me. First of all, in how I approached things and where I did it, and how I learned to tackle things that where you really feel the time was, you know, where you could ride the wave. Things like environment and trade, environment and security issues. I could tell you also, sorry, I don't have time for it, but. But where you, if you do something at the right time, you make real progress. And it's like a curve. It goes up and down. 
uh, and, and it will, who knows, maybe coronavirus will be uh, something that will make it go up further, but it may well go down. And uh, people will be worrying about that and about how to stimulate the economy, just as in uh, uh, 2008, 2009, and environment goes out the door a bit, uh, quite a bit sometimes. So you have to work your way through, and that's the long game that we play, because we're there continuously working, David on our streams, me on, I'm working on the Yangtze River right now, uh, for example, uh, uh, with the very interesting stuff that the Chinese are doing. But anyway, so my story is not to be in government, uh, but to work with people in government, in industry, in community, uh, work that are really people trying, struggling. And it isn't that, uh, that I'm any brighter uh, in fact, I'm not as bright as many of those people. Uh, but they need the assurances that what they're doing is the right way to go. And that's one of the things that knowledge can really make a big difference. Uh, because if you're dealing with science, if you're dealing with social science, which many people say is the hard science, uh, that, that is the basis on which you can build good policy. And that need continues uh, and, and will uh, be even more important in the future, in my view. So, so I, I put myself into an interesting position after I finished my PhD in fisheries ecology, and that was to go off to Southeast Asia, aided and abetted, by the way, by the uh, people in the University of Michigan, and actually went as an assistant professor of research. Uh, but it was through the Ford Foundation. It was a small group of us went. And, and uh, I worked in Indonesia, and I worked there actually be joining the Ford Foundation, which was a very strong organization, biggest foundation in the world. They've been working in Indonesia for many years. And interestingly, it was a small office of uh, very uh, motivated people, about a half a dozen people, and then with some senior people who really kind of controlled not what we did so much as helping gently to uh, decide how you worked in this policy area. And then you had a bunch of people on the Ford Foundation uh, uh, board, some of whom are very, very good people, believe me, including the vice president for environment. Uh, tough people, though. And, and so you got all these things funded. And then you made those as grants to people and sometimes turned around the other side and actually worked on the thing to make sure it was successful. So that was the successful side. Interestingly, the little office that I worked in, a few years after I left it, uh, after five years, Obama's mother came into that same office, and she was the one that did a really good job there of bringing in small-scale financing for particularly women. And, and, uh, so, and, and so it was all the same people that were doing the guiding and so forth. I didn't know that at the time uh, at all, and I, I probably met her maybe, but she was just one of the new people coming in, and I, I wouldn't necessarily get to know her. But, but it was the same sort of thing. That was the whole idea was to build, uh, not power for us, we, we had no power whatsoever, influence, influencing directions of things. So what I was fortunate enough, two things. One is that uh, an ecologist gets away with uh, everything, uh, you know, because you, all you have to do is say, well, you know, I, I, I really need to see this my, for myself in the field. So endless trips in the field, I learned <laughs> about tropical ecology, let me tell you, and even more important, uh, the influence of local villages, the influence of uh, traditional ways of doing things versus uh, new technological ways, et cetera. And, and in the, you know, going back to ecology centers, uh, I, uh, after I had left Indonesia, they had just appointed their first minister of the environment, a really brilliant man and a wonderful person. He's about 90 years old now and he's still active, highly respected around the world. Anyways, uh, going back to the, the cow farts, <laughs> the first meeting that he had, uh, he would call me in on these things, and he had his, all his uh, vice ministers uh, uh, there, and, and he said, now tell us about this uh, um, stuff about climate change. What does it mean for Indonesia? So I said to him, well, uh, uh, Mr. Emil Salim, uh, I've got to say that you've got to think about how you've got your cows going, because they fart a lot of uh, uh, stuff up into the atmosphere, you know, a lot of methane. And he shook his head and he said, you mean to say this is what we have to do to, <laughs> to and I always remember that meeting. But anyways, his saying, which was really good, was uh, we have to build the ship while sailing it. So in other words, we don't have the option of time, we don't have all the rest, we have to make wise decisions uh, and we have to build that ship and build it so that it actually sails and it doesn't sink. 
Uh, anyway. Uh, I'm going to thank you, Art, for that wisdom. Do you have a little more to say? I, I, just one, one thing more, and that is the need to build a new institutional structure. And I, I direct this because it, it's really been useful for me. Um, small organizations like an act, like the Ecology Center, can have a very loud voice. And I've always favored doing that. I don't like big bureaucracies. I like to have a small, I, I contend always, that if you choose about six people on almost any problem, you can make significant progress. And I learned that from an act. And I learned it uh, in all sorts of other settings, particularly in China, where I, 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 won't, I don't have time to go into that. But, uh, and and uh, so you don't have to think big in terms of size. You have to think big in terms of ideas and getting the right team of people to address the problem. And always ask, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? So those are the things that I learned out of the uh, teaching. Thank you, Art. Elizabeth Kingwell. In 1969, I was a graduate student of Dr. Stapp, who created the Environmental Education Program at the School of Natural Resources. I was one of the first women ever enrolled in the school here. It was primarily focused on schools. The heart of Stapp's work was to understand human interaction with the environment and to make others aware of the web of life and the hum human part in it. I always particularly remember a trip to Detroit that we took to the sewer plants and the huge incinerators that burned Detroit's garbage. This was also the time that the River Rouge caught on fire. There was plenty to learn and to teach. One of my own motivations was an incident when I was very young. We were visiting grandparents in California. On a trip to the zoo, the smog was really very thick. I was having trouble breathing, and I passed out, even as a small child. Outreach was my thing. I was a woman, a determined and rather loud woman, who was on a mission not to let the teach-in be just for students and the University of Michigan <coughs> campus. When the teach-in was over, everyone scattered except for two of us. We were hired to maintain a presence on campus that summer and to figure out what to do with the leftover money, about $10,000 from the teach-in. Earth Day on campus that year was rather anticlimactic. On April 22nd, I was on the Diag handing out pamphlets all by myself. <laughs> the campus was pretty empty. We were on a trimester system and we were on summer break. I had to leave the Diag by 12 o'clock noon because since the 22nd of April is also Lenin's birthday, the local SDS wanted to demonstrate. <laughs> they never showed up. <laughs> but there were men in suits strategically <laughs> located outside the building. That included the School of Natural Resources. I kid you not. They stuck out like sore thumbs in those hippie days. April Fool, no SDS demonstration. And aside was, we had a little office here, and who knows whether that still little office exists. It was a little narrow thing, probably eight feet wide, if that, and that's where all of our real work happened and where we talked. Down there, there was also an office next to us who, uh, there were two older people who were studying the Detroit River or something to do with water, and I always sort of thought they were FBI agents. It was an interesting time between Vietnam and the paranoia in general, um, and that click on my phone whenever I answered the phone. When I was, <laughs> and I used to say hi, actually, um, whenever, during the teach-in. Um, I wanted a space in Ann Arbor, and when I was asked to take that money and create an ecology center, similar to the ones they had in Berkeley, I agreed. I felt the traditional conservationists could be more effective if they were cooperating. Existing environmental groups like the Sierra Club, National Wildlife Society, and the Audubon Society rarely cooperated or even talked to each other because they had their own special interests and they were competitive for members. Those were early days. I wanted a space where they could interact, have meetings, and mostly, hopefully, learn to cooperate on common environmental goals. I helped the, environmental, the Ecology Center set up as a nonprofit and signed the lease. Volunteers cleaned and painted. We scrounged furniture and books for the library. We started a speaker's bureau, wrote educational pamphlets. We organized a glass recycling event. The center stayed pretty empty for a while. The organizations were quite wary. I stepped off the board, and the fall semester and others kept it going. 
It's with pride and gratitude to all who came after me that the Ecology Center in Ann Arbor is still going and growing. Not bad for a wannabe change agent. My master's thesis was on writing and implementing an environmental education program for the Girl Scouts of Metropolitan Detroit, and that's where I went after that fall. We reached thousands of women and girls in the metropolitan area, teach the girls and women, and watch the culture change. Michigan was a leader in the Don't Litter campaign. Current students don't remember what a big deal that was. It took a long time to catch on, but catch on it did. It's a rather unique American idea. Go look at a beach after a long weekend in some other country. Before the overnight cleaners, it's rather horrid. As Michigan began to be responsible for not throwing trash out the windows of moving cars, citizens began to take pride in a clean environment. The same is true for the environmental movement. Every school kid now knows about the environment and the web of life and the responsibility to make things better. The world is on board, except for our current president. I was thinking about President Nixon recently. That's what old folks do is remember. As badly as his presidency turned out, he was the one who signed the Clean Air Act and other pro-environmental laws that were revolutionary. The Clean Water Act and establishing the Environmental Protection Agency were on his watch. <clears throat> Climate change deniers today and the anti-environmental people do not remember how bad it was. And that change happened because people became concerned, took action, and supported those laws and regulations. This history is important because we are taking for granted the results of those regulations and acts. We have cleaner air in our cities, cleaner water in the Great Lakes, wilderness areas, and endangered species that have rebounded. Not perfect, but wonderful progress. I grew up near Detroit, and I just spent a couple of days down there showing my daughter around. The place is clean, kind of at least, in the middle. It's quite, quite different. We can lose that progress if we are not vigilant. The awareness of climate change has moved the bar much further along. The rest of the world who were buying our inoc pins 50 years ago are now ahead of us and leading in environmental action. They accept what we were teaching so long ago and are willing to take action much more fundamentally to keep the planet habitable. Our complacency and the American hubris keep us locked into a past that has been very forgiving until now. Europe has had serious challenges like migration to face recently that have enabled them to begin to face an even greater challenge dealing with climate change. The teachings on the environment and the upwelling of interest in act activism 20, 50 years ago was truly a black swan. It was a black swan movement for America and the world in general. We are now facing crises in many areas, the environmental degradations, climate change, mass migrations due to war and climate-induced hunger, and now a world pandemic that is halting everyday life. Thanks, excuse me. Uh, can we meet those challenges? What will be the tipping point now? What, what will bring our awareness to that that only must be fundamentally changed, but actually we already have. We are already in the throes of this. I'd like to, I've been listening to all of you and what I realized is what we were promoting was cooperation, was collaboration, was people coming together with our divided politics in a divided country. Somebody needs to reframe this whole time into a time where what can we agree on and what can we work together on. There's some really important sort of things like survival that need to be addressed. And it will only happen if we work together and find ways to collaborate. This country wouldn't exist without that ability to negotiate and to collaborate, and we have seemed to have lost the ability to do that. Thanks Gaylord Nelson for the vision and thanks to students across the country that brought environmental awareness to America. All that vision and work is on the line. The life work of many people, including me, of a unique generation that had hope for better days for the world. It's nice that you recycle. Now let's see if the current Michigan students and all those environmentally aware Americans have the hot spot to keep those protections from being erased and move forward with fundamental change. Oh, and uh, remember that Saturday in front of a mall in Ann Arbor where the first real glass recycling event took place? There were lines of cars and an overwhelming response and an overwhelming amount of glass to deal with. I still have some blue canning jars I rescued from the crusher. Small changes that grew large. We must continue, not retreat. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, I'll hear next from George Colin. I think uh, in terms of accomplishments, my uh, new colleagues on my right at the panel, Tim 
uh, Dhruv and Lily show a great accomplishment of our generation that there are people that are 50 years younger than we are that are well educated not only in technical and scientific skills but organizing skills and they have a, a history and a richness of social movements, cross-pollination and such that I think we didn't have in those in those days. And um, to me that's um, a real accomplishment and it's a real um, hope, hope for the future that, um, you know, we asked to give Earth a chance and we're still asking that and these people will be asking and to use um, particularly um, Lily's um, high school term, demand. <laughs> In the future, I loved it when she when she said that. Um, the institutions that um, have led to this include the universities. We've talked a great deal about ecology centers. Matt asked me to mention that the, it, it, there were two, and now 50 years later, apparently there's still kind of only two of the same name and. Um, characterization, so to speak, of what they do in, in a university town. But um, by December of 70, there were about 25, so we had enough to have our first meeting in uh, St. Louis. We found out that, uh, in looking back, the ecology centers were involved in, certainly in glass recycling. Probably people that still have wounds in their fingers from smashing. 50 years later, but um, the issue of urban freeways, the Ecology Center in Washington was very involved, the um, San Francisco and the Louisiana Ecology Centers merged the environmental, the newfound environmental concern and the young leadership with um, older ongoing community concerns, and there were really some great great uh, victories. In Washington, the um, federal um, highway, the Federal Highway Administration and various contractors uh, were defeated in their notion to um, extend the freeway from Baltimore down to Washington, knock out the duck pond at the University of Maryland, knock out a good section of owner-occupied middle-class black <laughs> homes in Northeast Washington, then tunnel under U Street, the um, height of the Renaissance, equivalent to the Harlem Renaissance in Washington, um, the, the cultural center of black Washington, would be modeled on the Cross Bronx Expressway. That's, that's <laughs> what they're working on. Then, when they got to Georgetown, they would tunnel under through the bedrock, <laughs> going right under the house where Jack and Jackie lived and other people, and come up at a place called the Three Sisters Islands, three little rocks in, in the river, and uh, build a Three Rivers Bridge and wipe out a good deal of Arlington going out to the uh, belt, Beltway. Well. Um, that, that was a coalition victory um, that began in 1964 um, and still was going on when I went to my last hearing on the Arlington uh, Freeway in, 19, in 19, about 2008 in which hmm. um, the promise, the so-called Coleman Commitment by Jerry Ford's Secretary of Transportation, William Col Coleman, was that I-66 going from essentially across from the Kennedy Center out to Virginia, straight through the Beltway, if you think of it from the center to, to 9 o'clock, would never be widened. Well, huh. it was made by the administrative branch of government. Congress overturned it. And um, so I think a lot of the uh, 
talk about persistence were some of us that remembered that, and unfortunately we didn't work on the legislative um, angle that was needed to overturn the, the administration policy. Um, that's, not, that's not an accomplishment, I think. The real accomplishment of the, envir the student-led environmental movement and the ecology centers and the other uh, deeply burgeoning uh, environmental movement, Barbara, were there 4,000 groups identified that Environmental Action had or something like that, was voicing. It gave people the opportunity to get out there and do something to uh, voice their concern and get organized. And, and it had the structure, the example, of people um, in indigenous communities talking about military intrusions in places like Love Canal where Lois Gibbs um, just said, no, we're not doing this. Uh, in the anti-nuclear movement of the 80s, which was full of demonstrations and civil disobedience and that kind of stuff. In various strikes and worker health um, Actions. The uh, shell. The first strike, environmental strike by the oil, chemical, and atomic workers union against Shell for safer working conditions led to a great deal. Its ripple effect was it led to a great deal of union democracy and voicing. So I think that's a, a very, a very widespread, and certainly the environmental justice movement, which we discussed in the last panel. So I think that that voicing and that activism and the building of the youth of today is the great accomplishment. Thank you, George. Barbara, take it away. Thank you. I'm going to go to a very, very high level. Um, one of the great um, differences between 1970 and uh, today is the structure of our economy. Uh, the place of unions in it, uh, the dramatic uh, concentration of wealth into very few percentage uh, of our uh, population, the uh, gradual and uh, dramatic decline in unions generally in this country, the impact of global economy, which has transformed us into less of a manufacturing center and more into a service economy. Um, those differences explain a lot to me about um, what uh, we need to do to continue our good progress. While we had the leadership of several of, of the national unions working with us in Washington, to actually adopt laws that would, according to the owners of the plants that would be affected by these laws, would adversely impact workers and the local economy. And it was a threat that they stared down and uh, accepted as an important sign of the progress that they recognized we had to make. Um, and. So those opportunities are now not there. Uh, we have a real deterioration in the amount of the middle class that can afford to pay for reforms and increased costs uh, to solve our climate crisis. We have more and more of a rural-urban divide in terms of where the wealth is and where the health and welfare is in rural America, where manufacturing um, and mining and coal plants are disappearing. So what can we do about um, trying to solve a lot of the climate change problems uh, that we need to address? I think we need a new model, a new way of thinking about how to bring the public along with us. Um, we are going to have to work very hard to convince folks who've developed a healthy skepticism of the feds, who feel that they have been left out of the economy that was promised to us by our parents in the post-World War boom 
Um, and I think we're going to have a much more difficult time trying to get consensus about what we do and who pays for it. Um, a line that I have come back to frequently in the last couple days of talking with folks here about the future of our movement. Um, I think there are new uh, opportunities. Um, our young people need to come to grips uh, with these issues in a way that, frankly, we had a lot of advantages given to us um, to adopt all of these reforms in the 1970s. Um, uh, in an economy that absorbed these costs and did not really result in a lot of the harms that the industrial community said would occur if we adopted them. Um, so you add on to that our social uh, media, uh, the prevalence of the potential for disinformation, the lack of national press the destruction of our local newspaper with reporters that actually go out and research stories and become experts in the field and translate information from scientists out to the people. Uh, we have some barriers that we really need to think through. And I hope the Ecology Center here in, in Ann Arbor can take on that task and help us think through some new ways of talking to and recruiting the public support for what is obviously a very important set of obligations that we're going to be facing over the next uh, decade or more. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Barbara. I want to help. I want to thank the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability for hosting this event. I want to thank the Ecology Center for partnering with them and also with the History Department on organizing this. We, we regret that some of the other huge events that were gonna happen in the rise up for the environment today and tomorrow are not gonna be happening at least anytime soon. But thank you for watching on the live stream. The Environmental Justice History Lab and the University of Michigan History Department students who put this together and, and went and found these activists, not all of them were hard to find, but some of them were and brought them back, interviewed them, thanks to all the students who did that work. The video for this event and the previous panel on environmental justice and student activism will be on the website of the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability and the History Department here in our Environmental Justice History Lab. Most of all, I want to thank the panelists, the former ENACT and Earth Day organizers for their inspiring and sobering, but mostly inspiring stories here today for coming back it's been wonderful to bring six such distinguished alumni of the University of Michigan back to campus for these events today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being on the panel. Thank you, Matt.